Hey, welcome to the Bridge Connection. Glad you joined with me today as we continue our studying the life of Jesus in his last week, the Passion Week. We've walked it through every day, and today is Thursday, and this day is um, takes some pretty somber turns on Thursday. So if you want to begin to turn to Mark chapter 14, we'll read out of Mark 14, and then we'll talk about some of the things that we read there. This, this week, uh, we see the preparation of the Passover. We see the Paschal meal and the Lord's Supper. We see Jesus washing the disciples' feet. We see Jesus pointed out as the traitor. All the disciples warned against deserting him. Uh, the great upper room discourse of John 13 to 17. Oh, man. John chapters 13 to 17. This is his teaching in the upper room to the disciples. And how beautiful it is. Uh, just saturate, saturate yourself maybe this week, reading all of those chapters over once. Chapter 17 is my favorite chapter ever. When I first got saved, somebody told me about chapter 17 of John. said, Jesus is praying for you there. And I read it and I, I wept and I still, tears come every time I read chapter 17 of John, reading how Jesus prayed for me. And I'm going to do it again when I'm through with this. I'm going to read it once again just because I need to hear him praying, talking to the Father about me. And you need to hear the same thing as he talks about you. Then we're going to talk about the agony in Gethsemane. That's what we're going to talk about today and all these events. I just want to, and I and really can't explain it. I'll do the best of my ability to just say a few things because it is so beyond our ability to comprehend. We're, you know, the betrayal, the arrest is on Thursday and so forth. So pick it up at verse 32 of Matthew 14. Then they came to a place which was called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy and they did not know what to answer him. Then he came the third time and said to him, are you still sleeping and resting? It's enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. I want to look at this Garden of Gethsemane and um, look at verse 33 uh, again. Uh, this is a little different translation, maybe. I think it's uh, NIV where I wrote this down. And it says, and he began to be filled with horror and deep distress. In verse 34, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Now, 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 get this. The disciples had seen Jesus meet every event with confidence. They'd seen him approach every problem they've, they've come across with, with power. When they were faced with the task with feeding the 5,000 men plus women and children, Jesus wasn't filled with horror. When they were on the sea in the midst of a mighty storm, he wasn't overcome with distress. When his friend Lazarus had died, he had grief, but he wasn't crushed with that grief. And in each of these situations, he had responded with faith and power. And in each situation, a miracle occurred. They'd seen him walk on water. They'd seen him still an angry sea and calm a raging storm. They had seen him heal the sick and give blind, sight to the blind. They had seen him raise the dead. And now they saw him filled with horror and deep distress. They heard him say, my soul is crushed with grief. They'd never seen him like this before. See, Jesus knew what was about to happen. He knew why he came. He, he knew who he was. He, he knew what he had to do. He'd been telling his disciples what was going to happen, but they just didn't get it. A few days early, just a few days earlier, he told his disciples, this is in Matthew chapter 20, when we get to Jerusalem, the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die. 
Then they will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, whipped, and crucified. But on the third day, he'll be raised from the dead. He had told them as plainly as he could what would happen, and the disciples heard him, but I'm sure they had hoped against hope that somehow it wouldn't take place exactly that way. Maybe he was speaking allegorically. Maybe this was some kind of a parable. He had spoken parables, parables before that we didn't, they didn't understand, and they asked him to explain, so maybe things will turn out differently. In fact, when he entered the streets of Jerusalem triumphantly on the cult of a donkey with a cheering crowds shouting, Hosanna, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I'm sure the disciples let themselves forget, at least for a moment, what he talked about his death. But now, in an olive grove called Gethsemane, in the darkness of the night, they saw Jesus experience horror, deep distress, and crushing grief. And Jesus found himself alone. He asked his disciples to pray for him, but they fell asleep. He knew that soon they would abandon him. He knew that he would be mocked and beaten and tortured and murdered, and he knew that he would face it alone. Words could never express what Christ experienced. Words are just inadequate, totally inadequate. Using all the descriptive words in the world would be as inadequate in describing the sufferings of Christ as using a syringe to drain an ocean. There was the mental and emotional agony, the weight, the pressure, the anguish, the sorrow, the excessive strain such as no man had ever experienced. He was the Son of God, maker of heaven and earth, yet images and thoughts were pressing ever so heavily into his spirit. The images and thoughts of the unbelief of all men everywhere, the rejection of his own people, the Jews, the malice of the world's leaders, both Jew and Gentile, religious and civil, the betrayal of his of one of his own, Judas, the desertion of all of his men, the denial by the leader of his own man, Peter, the injustice and condemnation of his trial, the ridicule and pain of being scourged, spit upon, slugged, cursed, mocked, crowned with thorns, and nailed to the cross and killed. There was this physical, physical experience of death while being the son of God. What's this like, what is it like for the Son of God to die, just as all men die. If just the physical aspect of Christ's death is considered, his death is still different than all other men, but it was more than that. There was a spiritual death. There was a death to cover our sins that had never happened before. There was a spiritual death that he would be separated from the Father for the first time in all eternity. That when my sins were placed upon him, the father turned away and there was a separation and he knew that was coming. And I don't think it was the physical aspect of the death that he was anguishing over. I don't think it was the physical pain as, as terrible as that was. I don't think that's what he was anguishing over. I think he was anguishing over. He knew that he was gonna be separated from the father like it had never happened throughout all eternity. And he just, in fact, when he was on the cross, one of the things he cried out was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what he was crying out was, Father, where are you? We're separated. And then the agony of that for just those moments on the cross. And that's where the, the, the anguish and the despair came from. And if he was crying out so desperately in, in agony for just, moments of separation from the Father, can you even begin to imagine what eternity separated from the Father will be like? That's why we embrace Jesus. That's why we believe that Jesus died for our sins and he's made a place for us in heaven. And if we reject what he's done for us, what we're gonna see you know, tomorrow uh, as, as we continue this study that he died on the cross and what he went through and and he, and he gave up his spirit for you and for me so that we could spend eternity in heaven with him instead of being rejected and going to the place that would, had been prepared for the devil and his followers, a place called hell. For eternity, when it was so devastating to him for just these few moments. But here's a, another crucial point I want us to get. Man. His followers let him down. But you know what? He'll never let us down. His followers abandoned him, but 
He will never abandon you. In fact, his very reason for being in the garden that night is so that you and I won't have to face life on our own. We can face every single day, every challenge, every crisis, every temptation, every moment of grief with him right beside us. Jesus endured his suffering alone, but you don't have to. He'll be with you. And since he has suffered, he knows exactly what we're going through. Since he has faced temptation, he understands what it's like. This is what the writer of Hebrews meant when he said this in chapter four, verse 15. He said, this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses for he faced all of the same temptations we do, yet he did not sin. Listen, when you face your times of sorrow, when you face your own private Gethsemane, you can call on him and he's gonna hear you. Listen to the words of, that God spoke through King David. Psalm 50, verse 15. Trust me in your times of trouble and I will rescue you and you will give me glory. Hebrews 13, five, God also promised, I will never fail you. I will never forsake you. We learn in Gethsemane that Jesus was alone in his agony so that you and I will never have to be. He's promised to be with you. And you need to grasp that and hold on to that and realize that as we're walking through this week and we see every decision that he made, every prayer that he prayed, every statement, it was for you. It was for me. So that we would have him to walk with us every day of our lives. And he'll never leave. He'll never forsake. And when I see him praying this prayer of, of agony and, and sweating, as it were, the Bible says, great drops of blood. It's as though he... He was feeling like he was going to die because of the weight of the sin of the world was going to be put upon him and he would be separated from the Father. But it says another time, another place, that he moved towards Jerusalem for the joy that was set before him. What joy is that? The joy of knowing that you and I can spend eternity with him. The joy that knowing that one day we will see him face to face knowing that he was going to pay the price that separated us from, from the presence of God. We could not know God because of our sin, and we could not be forgiven because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, and that's the way it was designed, and our blood was not sufficient because it's, it's, it's not clean. So Jesus came, lived a sinless life so that he could shed his blood that would wash away our sin and we can rejoice and be exceedingly glad because of what he's done for us and what he wants to do every single day of our lives would you pray with me please father as we sit before you we cry out from our spirits and we say thank you father for sending jesus to take our place on that cross to take our place in death, to take our place in the grave, to experience a separation from you that we will never have to experience, ever, because we have decided to believe that Jesus came and died for us. God himself came and died for us. And when you said on that cross, Jesus, It is finished. The payment for our sin was done. And we thank you. Lord, I pray if there's anybody listening right now that doesn't have that assurance of, of eternity with you, if they've never understood really what you went through and why this whole event transpired, it was for their forgiveness. For we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, the Son. You so love the world that you gave your only begotten Son. Jesus, you came and willingly went to the cross 
so that we could know eternity, you and the Father, forever. And I pray if there's anybody listening that the Lord has not done that, you'd speak to their hearts right now. Holy Spirit, you would draw them to you and they would just cry out to you, thank you, come into my life, Jesus. Thank you for what you went through. I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. I pray for the rest of us that this, this week we continue to be a week of, of viewing what you did for us and what that means in our lives. Thank you, precious, precious Savior. It's in your name I pray. Hey, do yourself a favor. Pick up your Bible. Read John 17. Listen to Jesus' prayer for you. God bless you. We see you tomorrow. All right.